This morning, we are in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, and we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 28. Matthew 16, 11 through 28. And the title of the message is Satan or Saint? And it has to do with uh, the Apostle Peter because uh, he was actually both. <laughs> the backstory on this um, um, text as we come to it this morning is that Jesus has sent his disciples out into the countryside to do all sorts of things, to, um, to heal, to tell people about uh, the kingdom. Uh, he's sent them out to, uh, to tell the good news that Jesus has come and that their wait is over. Messiah has actually come. But he sent them out with the power to cast out evil spirits and power to, um, to heal people and power to, uh, to give people comfort. Uh, he sent them out with a tremendous amount of power. And so after they'd been in, out and gone a while and, and had magnificent results, they came back all excited and started to tell Jesus about everything that had happened and about how uh, just even the demons were subject to their name and had to flee. And uh, Jesus said, you know, that's really great. I want to know something. I've got a question for you. He said, what are people saying about me? Who do they think I am? And some of the disciples, some of the apostles that were sent out said, well, some people think that you're uh, Jeremiah, the prophet. Some people think that you're John the Baptist, resurrected from the dead. Uh, other people think you're this, that, or the other thing. And uh, Jesus then said, you know, I've got another question for you. And he asked them the question of the ages. He said, I hear that. I understand that. Let me ask you a question. Who do you say that I am? He got really personal. And one of the people to whom he got personal with this question was Peter. Peter was the one who came up with the answer. Didn't take him a heartbeat to do it. And Peter may be the most consummate enigma of all. He's one of the most confusing personalities in scripture. And yet he may be one of the most familiar. I'll tell you why in just a moment. With this big fisherman, if you have followed his career in the Gospels at all, you know that it's either good news or bad news. You never know what he's going to say. He may be hero, he may be zero. He may be feast or famine. One thing is for sure, have you ever been a hero or felt like a hero? You know, when I remember when, when my children were this big and they didn't know any better and they thought I hung the moon and stars. I mean, that look in their eyes made me feel like a hero. But you know, there are some times that I disappointed those kids, and then I felt like a zero. So that's why I said we can identify with who Peter is and what Peter said and well, the things that came out of his mouth at times. Peter was the great apostle. He made the declaration when Jesus asked the question, uh, who do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? Jesus, Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the ever living God. But outside Pilate's gate, not too long after that, Peter was a wimp. When asked about Jesus, he denied he even knew him. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection, Peter stood on the portico of the temple and proclaimed that the Messiah had come and that he had been killed, but he was out of the grave. He was alive again. And he had the keys of the kingdom of heaven and hell and earth and life and death. He thundered that message on Pentecost and thousands accepted Christ and came into the church. But yet he trembled with fear for his reputation when the delegation from Jerusalem some weeks later found out that he'd been eating with Gentiles. Why such a roller coaster up and down spiritual ride with Peter? It's hard to say. It's hard to say, except that isn't he like us? <laughs> isn't he like you? Isn't he like me? Sometimes we're way up there. Sometimes we just get it. And other times we don't have a clue. Well, in the meeting between the disciples and Jesus, after the disciples had been out on that healing tour, where Jesus asked him this question, and Peter gives the answer, Jesus says, congratulations, Peter, you, you know what you're talking about, but it didn't come from any human agency. My Father in heaven gave it to you. My Father in heaven told you what to say here. And he says, I'm going to tell you the truth. You're Peter, 
that means rock, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. Now, Jesus did not mean that he was going to build a church based on the strength of Peter's character, or Peter's nature, or Peter's abilities. What he did mean was that on the confession that Peter made that Jesus was the Son of the living God, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Promised One, the Savior, on that confession, the bedrock of that truth, Jesus was going to build his church. Jesus called Peter son of John. The name Jonah and John are very intertwined. They're almost the same name between Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek. We don't know if Peter's father was actually named Jonah or John, but Jesus may have been playing on the name to unmask the character of Peter because just like Jonah, Peter was going to have a career of incredible failure and unbelievable mountaintop. Zero to zero, zero back to hero. Peter became the spokesman for the disciples. I want you to know this, though. Peter was not chosen for his brains. Few preachers are. He was chosen for his heart. Jesus declared that Peter had a heart in tune with God. If you were to look at our text in verse 17, it says that. God told you what to say. That means he has a heart to listen to God. And the other apostles observed what some other people thought about Jesus, but Jesus needed a leader, and that's why he chose Peter, one who was not a follower, but a leader when it counted most. And the text here displays some things. It displays great spirituality on Peter's part. It displays human dullness on Peter's part. But it also displays God's mercy, and that's what I want to center in on here. But all of this is wrapped up. This great spirituality, great human dullness, and God's mercy is wrapped up in the lovable, bumbling, magnificent apostle Peter. And that which makes this incident so truly relevant for you and for me is that we see ourselves in the humanity of Peter. We see ourselves acting out like that. Well, the first thing that we see here is St. Peter, Matthew 16, verse 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say I am? That the Son of Man is. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John or Jonah, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, rock of Peter's confession, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. How do I know that the church is still going to be here after covid 19 because jesus said all the powers of hell will not conquer it now i'm not talking about pleasant hill united methodist church you know if tomorrow uh, everybody got ag angry at the preacher and decided never to show up again this church would go out of business right the church would stop but the church of jesus christ will never go out of business Jesus said to Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Jesus asked this question, who do you say that I am? In order to search the people, the, the hearts of the disciples, they had given him an answer about what people were saying. But Jesus probed deeper. He said, who do you say that I am? You, who do you say? What do you think? Where is your heart speaking? Didn't take Peter long to come back with the answer. Uh, this was not the first time that the subject of Jesus' divinity had come up, but his response, Peter's response, was the most definitive response about who Jesus is ever. Matter of fact, to this day, this is the response. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Man, I'll tell you what, if you... There's a, there's a practice called Lectio Divina. It's where you have a, a scripture sentence such as this one. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I read that what? I read it in a monotone voice, same pitch, same volume. 
You are the son of Christ. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. I didn't slow down. I didn't speed up. I didn't raise my voice. I didn't lower my voice. I didn't put any inflection. I didn't even bat my eyes. I just read it flat. Lectio Divina says, slow down with the scripture and think about each word. Peter said, you. What Peter was saying to Jesus is, let's say, all right, Gene, you're in the middle. I'm sorry. I'm pointing right at you. This is Jesus over here. And I'm, I'm playing Peter. You. You and you alone. That's the force of that word. You are the Christ. The Christ. What does it mean when you put that definite article in front of the object? It means the one and only. So this could be read this way. Peter said, you and you alone, you are the only one who can be called Christ. That's what Peter said to Jesus. Then he said, you, you alone, you are the Christ, the only Christ, the only one who could be Christ. You are the, again, definite article, the son of the living God, the living God, the only true God. Peter is saying to Jesus, you and you alone, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the appointed one, the coming one, the savior of all. You're the son, the son, the one and only. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he sent, come on, say it, his, did you say only begotten son? That's what Peter said. The only begotten son of the living God. You see the force of Peter's confession? You see how this is the message of the entire Bible? That doesn't leave anything to the wiggle room here, does it? No, imagine, no imagination can, can pick that apart any clearer than that. Jesus was not referring to Peter's character as the foundation for the church. That character was fickle and short-sighted at best, just like yours and mine. But rather, Jesus was referring to Peter's confession, the truth. Jesus is indeed Messiah. That would be the bedrock upon which the church would be built and upon which the church would stand. Now, Peter was a saint, to say that, because God gave him that. Saint in the sense that he was saved. He was a person who believed in Christ, accepted Christ, was willing to worship Christ as God. But he could also come crossways with Jesus' plan from time to time, and can't we always? He became, this Saint Peter became Satan Peter. Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now, here's where Satan shows up. Satan Peter. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. How many of you have ever tried to rebuke God? Let me see your hands. <laughs> I mean, you know, whoa. That, that's tough business. He's rebuking. He's, you know what a rebuke is? It's not just getting in somebody's face. It's telling them they're wrong. That is the textbook definition of what a rebuke is. You're willing to tell... Bless you. Are you willing to tell God he's wrong? My goodness. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. God forbid that God should work out his plan. Peter said, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, say it, Satan. Satan. We joke a lot about that, you know, when somebody puts out the Rocky Road ice cream or, you know, all the pie and cake and whatever, we say, get me behind me, Satan. And, you know, it's a good joke. It's, it's appropriate. You know, we know where temptation comes from, don't we? And that's what Jesus is pointing at here. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, you're tempting me. You are a stumbling block to me. You're trying to put something in the way of the path that I have chosen to walk. You're not setting your mind on divine things, but on human things. You don't have the mind of God on this, Peter, is what Jesus is saying. That's why we can call him Satan. Now, the name Satan literally means adversary. I know, I know. Satan is the devil. He's Lucifer. He's the evil one. That's true. 
But technically, the word Satan simply means adversary, somebody who opposes you. How many of you have ever played football? Okay, I'm showing my maleness here. All right, when you line up on the line, and when the quarterback, you know, is about to say, let's go. Well, that's not what he says, is it? He says, hike, right? What happens? The adversaries go at each other, right? That's what the word means, adversary. One who is trying to impede your progress. Peter had spoken from the heart. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, no, this should never happen to you. You should never be crucified. You should never be killed. You're going to lead us all the days of our life. Peter had spoken from the heart, but sometimes I think the Lord just wants us to sit and to listen to him and to keep our mouths shut. That's never been a strong suit in most preachers, and it wasn't Peter's strong suit. Sometimes I wonder why Paul left that out of the spiritual gifts in his letter to the Ephesian church and the Corinthians about that spiritual gift of keeping your mouth shut, you know. Uh, sometimes we need to exercise that gift. Jesus said, I'm going to be killed and then raised. Peter reacted. Peter uh, rebuked Jesus, and Jesus turned around and rebuked Peter. They stood in opposition to each other, and therefore, with Jesus being God, Peter was playing Satan, the adversary. Now, why Jesus rebuked Peter has to do with the mindset of many Jews who are severely oppressed by the Roman Empire. We hear a lot about oppression and about disenfranchisement these days in our culture. Well, <clears throat> what's going on in our culture has nothing on what happened in ancient Israel and how the Roman government took over and how they put to death people that they wanted to put to death and it was capricious, and they were always in power, so they did what they wanted to do. The word Messiah to most of the ancient Jews simply meant political freedom. It meant economic boom. Literally, I, I think it's uh, President Trump's um, slogan the first time around in the first campaign was make America great again. And I think what he had in mind was make us great in terms of leadership in the world. I think what he had in mind was make us great economically. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think there's anything evil about that. But to attach the word Messiah to that kind of thinking, Jesus did not want anyone getting the idea that his mission was to put a chicken in every pot and two cars in every garage. His mission was not a political mission. His mission was a prison mission. He came to set the captives free, the captives of sin. The disciples were subject to the same misunderstanding. Jesus wanted them to clearly see that this mission was to be accomplished by a cross and not by a sword. Peter had his problems with this. He had left everything for Jesus. He had left his fishing business back home, his family back home, laying it all on the hopes that this leader, this carpenter from Galilee, would lead them to political freedom, economic boom, and power, and everything would be all right. Peter couldn't see beyond his own possible losses here because this cross thing could have economic Im implications that were severe. The horror, the degradation of a cross was awful, and so he wanted to change Jesus' mind. Jesus told Peter, get behind. Interesting lesson here in this exchange. Peter was interested in keeping Jesus healthy. Why? He'd left that fishing business, his family behind, to stake it all on following this carpenter just didn't make sense to Peter that the leader would die. What would happen to the movement then? <laughs> Could give the same answer about Martin Luther King. He died. He was assassinated. Did the movement continue? It's still going on, isn't it? Regardless of what you think of the protests, regardless of what your position is on which side you come down, or if you're just in the middle and you don't know which way to turn on all of what's going on in our world today, the reality is that movements don't die because a leader dies. Movements die because they weren't real. Movements live because they are, and the church is still alive, and the church is still strong. What Jesus said to Peter unmasked the fact that Peter was more interested in his own agenda and what would happen to him than following Jesus. Here's the lesson that we get out of this. Anytime we leave revealed heavenly truth, how many of you have a Bible? All right, can you hold it up for me? 
That is revealed heavenly truth, the Word of God. Anytime you leave the Word of God, revealed heavenly truth, for the comfort of human reasoning, you become, as Peter, a stumbling block to the kingdom of God. And you and I do that all the time. How do I know that? Because I do it all the time. What do we do when we pray like this? God, I don't like this thing that's happening to me. Change it. Do you think God knows what he's doing? If you do, say amen. 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 Then why do we want to change his will all the time? This COVID virus, you believe that God has allowed this at least to happen? Maybe even caused it? I don't know. But I do know this. If he didn't cause it, he allowed it. Because nothing that God doesn't allow ever happens. He is sovereign. Sometimes Methodists have a hard time believing that, but God truly is sovereign. Like Peter, we tend to instruct God rather than listen for the instructions that he's trying to give us. Sometimes we just need to use our spiritual gift of humility to hush up. Well, there's redemption in this thing. Peter was told by Jesus to do what? Get behind. Like Peter, we need to learn that lesson that Satan has always tried to push God in the direction of his agenda, and God has always said, no. Following is done from behind. I am the one who does the leading here. That's God's voice. We have a choice in the church. And as we come to a close on our worship here this morning, I want to talk about that choice. When you and I demand our rights, our way, our plan, we're not following. Whether it's in the church or in the community or in our families, when we demand our rights, when we demand that it's done our way, when we demand that our plan be worked out, our plan be the one to be followed, we are not following, we are out front. And frankly, when we do that in the name of God, we are just as much of an adversary as Peter was on that day. Jesus said to Peter, get behind, you get in line, I will lead. Peter, you follow. The fact is, is if we follow as God's children, God is going to bless. How many of you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask a serious question now. It's a serious question. Put that serious look on your face. I can't see your face for the masks. All right. Here's the question. How many of you, as a child, ever got a whooping? I got to raise two hands here. Every time I turned around. All right. One more survey question. How many of you got a whooping for obeying your parents? End of story. If we follow God obeying what God has said, we don't get a whooping, we get blessings. When we insist on getting our own way, when we get willful over things, we pay the price. And that price is lost spiritual power, lost blessings. I've become convinced that this mindset is the main reason the church is split, preachers get fired, and all human-run organizations shrivel and die. People want what they want. They really don't want to follow anyone, even the Son of God. We've seen the great spirituality of Peter here, as well as his spiritual dullness. But I want you to note the mercy of God as Jesus shares the principle, the great principle of following how to change a devil or a Satan into a saint. The last five verses. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And by the way, what does it profit if we gain the whole world and lose our soul? One of the principles of the kingdom is that everything works opposite of the way the world sees things. For instance, if you want to be first, you have to learn to serve from behind. If you want to live, you have to learn to die to self. If you want to receive, you have to learn to give. We have a God who turns everything on its ear. Peter had made an important connection with heaven in recognizing the divinity of Jesus. But he made the incredible blunder of thinking he had changed Jesus' mind about the cross. 
Now, Jesus laid out for them the one consistent demand of discipleship. I'm going to give it to you. I'm not going to charge you extra for it. The most important information for a disciple of Jesus Christ, anyone who names the name of Christ, anyone who aims to be saved because he trusted in Christ and wants to follow him as Lord, this is the plan. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to follow Jesus. You have to get behind and follow. You can't lead and follow at the same time. That's like trying to serve two masters. You're going to be a follower of Jesus. You have to give up your own life. Not necessarily physically, but the emotional you, the rational you, the willful you, that part of self-determination. You have to give that up in favor of God calling the shots in your life. That's what following Jesus is all about. I'm going to close with a story that is a true story, something that is written in history that happened about 20 years before this incident that I'm reading about, that we've been reading about this morning. The disciples knew what Jesus was saying, and Jesus knew what he was doing when he asked them if they really knew what they were doing. Because if they really wanted to be his disciples, they had to pick up their cross daily and follow him. 20 years prior, there was a rebellion against Roman authority in a little town close to where Jesus was raised, Nazareth. Um, close to where Jesus was residing at this point. 20 years before, this rebellion went against Rome from a little town called Sephorus. Again, only four miles away from where Jesus lived. A man by the name of Varus was one of the farmers in that area. And he really objected to everything that Rome was doing. Their oppression, their killing people, their uh, taking their lands, imprisoning people capriciously. No trials, no real justice for the Israelites. Darius took exception to all of that. And he organized the farmers into an army. Gathered 10,000 strong. All the farmers from all the surrounding area joined behind him. And together... They attacked the Roman garrison at Sephorus, four miles away from Nazareth, and they killed every one of the soldiers. Rome heard about it. Rome responded. Rome sent an army and dispersed the armies of Varus, all those farmers. Most of them farmers went back to farming. But the Romans captured about 2,000 of them. They were going to teach these rebels of Galilee a lesson not to be rebels. And they took them one by one along the roads leading out of the town of Sepphoris in every direction and crucified them. Every single one of 2,000 rebel, uh, rebels. They would put one on a cross. Right, everybody look this way. There's a road out there. Pleasant Hill Road. Look in that direction. You can see so far. If you look in that direction, you can see so far. When you look in this direction over here towards the corn, what's the furthest thing you can see? I can see the corn. I can see the trees behind the corn. That's as far as I can see. What the Romans would do, they'd stick down across here and put one of the rebels up on it. Wait for him to die. They would march down the road until they were almost out of sight. Put up another cross. Put another rebel on the cross. They did it in that direction. 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 No matter which direction you looked on a road leading out of Sephorus, there was a crucified rebel. You never lost sight of it until they had 2,000 rebels on 2,000 crosses. Jesus was 10 years old when this happened. I want you to imagine a 10-year-old boy getting up every morning and as he would go over to the carpenter shop to help his father, if his father was still alive at that point, and as he looked down the road, to, towards the forest, the same roads 
that led him from Nazareth to Sephoris, where he had business. He probably sold a table or two down there. Or this direction, past Nazareth, he could see another cross. Everywhere his eyes fell, he could see a rotting corpse on a cross. Ten years old. Do you think Jesus knew exactly what he was asking when he said to his disciples, if, you, if you're willing to follow me, you have to pick up your cross daily and follow me. He knew exactly the cost of carrying crosses. And he still says it to you and to me today. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and embrace me by taking up their cross and following me. What does it take to change an adversary, a Satan, into a saint? Everything you've got. Because everything you've got is not wrapped up in your bank account. Everything that you've got is not <clears throat> wrapped up in your accomplishments. Everything that you've got is not wrapped up in how good you feel about yourself or how good you feel today. Everything that you've got is wrapped up in your will and in your awareness of the fact that you are a human being and you are accountable to God. That's everything that you've got. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ wants from you. That's Jesus' plan. That's his demand if you'd be his follower because he is coming back. And I pray that you've answered the most personal question, who do you say that I am? And if you haven't answered that question yet in your life, don't be afraid. Do it. Why? Because the God who loves you enough to die for you is asking that question. Let's pray together. Father God, this is indeed a most personal question. You have asked each one of us, who do you say I am? Lord, it was so much easier and safer to read about it, how Jesus asked that question to a small band of men back 2,000 years ago. But Father, it's discomforting and downright scary to hear those words ringing in our ears right here and now, requiring a yes or a no. There's no room for maybe. There's no room for we'll see. Lord, we know that there's no room for perhaps tomorrow. Lord, when you speak to our hearts, there's an urgency that won't let this decision be put off. Lord, we want time to think about this, and we would rather not be pushed into that corner. Father, teach us that there is no corner of the earth or universe where you're not asking that question. Help us to not make Peter's blunder when he thought that he could change your mind with his better plan. Help us, Lord, to know beyond doubt that there are only two answers, yes or no. Help us to make the yes choice, to follow, to leave all the adversary attitudes behind, all those plans that make us a stumbling block to the kingdom. Help us, Lord, to get behind Jesus and follow. For the glory and the honor and the praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit, to honor and lift up the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives, we pray. Amen.